There's a true story about the student who showed up late to math class. He copied the problem that was already written on the board, assuming it was homework, and solved it that week. Only afterwards did he find out that the teacher had put it on the board as an example of an unsolvable problem. So this question, what is the meaning of life, is the classic unsolvable problem. For thousands of years, people have been trying to figure it out. It's the punchline cliche of unanswerable questions. But right now, let's be the naive ones that don't know it's considered unsolvable and just figure out the meaning of life in under 20 minutes, okay? Life is what? What word do you think goes in that blank? Life is what? Any ideas? Well, let's look at what some of the different options that philosophers and smarties have said. Some say life is time. Life is all about time, that the definition of life is the time between when you're born and when you die. So the very literal meaning of life is time. So if life is time, the way to have a good life is to use time wisely. How can you use time wisely? Five ways. Number one, remember it's limited. If you find out tonight that you've only got one year left to live, you'll make the most of this next year. If you act like life is infinite, you won't. To achieve great things, only two things are needed, a plan and not quite enough time. So give yourself tight deadlines. Remember you could die at any time. Don't delay. How can you use time wisely? Number two, be mostly future focused. Make most of your current actions serve your future self. That means learn, practice, exercise, delay gratification, save and invest your money and build towards your ideal future. People who do this are more successful and even happier. But too much future focus can lead to being a successful person on your fourth marriage with no true friends because too much future focus can take time away from important things that need you to be in the moment. How can you use time wisely? Number three, be somewhat present focused. Sometimes pull your head out of the future and give your full attention to the present. Relationships, communication, and sex require this. But too much present focus is hedonism where you're only living for immediate gratification with as much excitement and novelty as possible. And too much present focus leads to an empty bank account with no impulse control. And too much present focus robs you of the deeper happiness of delayed gratification, achieving long-term goals, and developing valuable expertise. How can you use time wisely? Number four, be somewhat past-focused. To remember your past is to live twice. So keep your life in the context of the past to see how far you've come. Put aside time to reinterpret your past events as a powerful reminder that you can reinterpret your present and your future too. How can you use time wisely? Number five, get in the zone. You know the feeling of flow where you're totally lost in your work. It's not too easy and not too hard, and the work itself has clear goals and is its own reward. People at the end of their life who claimed to be the happiest with their life were the ones who had spent the most time in the state of flow. So for a good life, pursue the work that puts you in this state and avoid the things that pull you from this state. So... Life is time? What do you think? Pretty good argument? Well, let's look at another perspective. Some say life is choice. Life is all about choice. You make a hundred little choices a day and a hundred big choices in your life. And these choices change your entire life. That your life is created by your choices. Therefore, life is choice. So if life is choice, the way to have a good life is to make good choices. How can you make good choices? Four ways. Number one, let instinct trump logic. The different parts of your brain started developing at different periods in evolution. 
The oldest part of your brain, the one that's been evolving since we were fish, deals with instincts, fears, and gut feelings. But the newest part of your brain, the one that's pretty uniquely human, deals with logic, language, and predictions. This newest part of your brain is still kind of in beta. That's why a $5 calculator can beat it at math. But this oldest part was launched a billion years ago and has been in production and development ever since. Now, everything you observe and learn is first processed by your logical brain, but then the results are permanently stored as instincts, fears, and gut feelings. So your instincts and emotions hold the culmination of everything you've ever observed and learned. So you'll make better choices if you listen to your instincts instead of relying too much on your logical brain. How can you make good choices? Number two, stop at good enough. You now have more options than ever. You try to choose the best option, the best career, the best school, the best boyfriend, girlfriend, partner, spouse. But thinking this way makes you feel worse about the choices you've made. Because you're more aware than ever of all the options you didn't choose and the benefits of each. So don't seek the absolute best. Stop when you find an option that is good enough. You'll make an equally good choice, but more importantly, you'll feel much better about it. And happiness counts. How can you make good choices? Number three, set limits. Every choice you have to make causes a little bit of pain. So having choice in life is good, but that doesn't mean that having more choice is always better. You're actually happier when you let other people make some choices for you. If you're very sick, you want your doctor to choose what's best, not say, oh, no, there's dozens of options, what do you want to do? I think this is part of the appeal of religion. It gives you rules. It makes many of the choices for you. So set limits to your choices in life. Cut off some options. Give yourself rules. How can you make good choices? Number four, choose important, not urgent. You know the difference between what's long-term important versus short-term urgent. What's urgent are the emails and texts and tweets and calls and reading the news. But what's important is spending a thousand hours to learn some new skill that will really help you in your life or work. And what's important is giving your full undistracted attention to the important people in your life. And what's important is taking the time to get exercise or collect and share what you've learned. But none of these things will ever be urgent. So you have to ignore the tempting cries of the urgent and deliberately choose what you know is long-term important. So, life is choice? What do you think? Pretty good argument? Let's try another. What about life is memory? Some say life is memory, that the future doesn't exist. It's just something we imagine, and the present is gone in a millisecond, so everything we experience in life is a memory. That you could live a long life, but without a lot of memories, you only experienced a short life. If you don't remember your life, it's like it never happened, so life is memory. So if life is memory, the way to have a good life is to make more memories. How can you make memories? Change routines, break monotony, move, make a major change whenever you can. These are your chronological landmarks. These are the hooks where you'll hang your memories. Then document it, blog it, not in some company's walled garden, but in a format that you can archive and look through in 50 years or your grandkids could look through in 100 years. Keep a private blog for your future self and tell all these tales of where you've been, what you did, and the quirky people you've met along the way. You'll be surprised how much you forget if you don't record it. Socrates said the unexamined life is not worth living. But what about the forgotten life? So life is memory? What do you think? Want to do one more? What about life is learning? Both my smart friends and my spiritual friends insist that the meaning of life is learning, that the reason you're here is to learn, not just for your own sake, but for everyone alive and future generations, the meaning of your life is to learn. So if life is learning, 
the way to have a good life is to learn a lot. How can you learn a lot? Well, instead of talking about learning techniques, let's just talk about getting the right mindset so you can learn more than you realize. You've probably heard about the fixed mindset and the growth mindset. The fixed mindset says, I am good at this, or I am bad at this. This starts in childhood when your parents say, you're so good at math. Then you think, I'm good at math. But then if you do poorly on one test, you think, oh, they were wrong. I'm not just not good at math. See, most people think this way. You can hear it when they say, oh, she's just a natural singer, or I'm just no good at dancing. But the growth mindset says that anyone can be good at anything. Skill comes only from practice. Now, two impossibly hard tests were given to hundreds of children. After the first test, all of the students were praised, but half of the students were privately told these six words. You must be good at this. And the other half were privately told these six words. You must have worked really hard. Then, when they were given the second test, the students who were told, you must be good at this, did 20% worse on the second test. So those six words encouraged a fixed mindset that made them feel there was no point in trying. You either are or you aren't. But the students who were told, you must have worked really hard, did 30% better on the second test. So those six words encouraged a growth mindset that made them feel that working harder made all the difference. So this is a 50% difference in performance because of six quick words by one teacher. Now you multiply that by all the people in your life and all the days you hear feedback and all the things you tell yourself, and you can see how this simple difference in mindset can make or break a life of learning. So parents, pay attention to this. You may be harming your kids when you tell them they're good at things. And successful people, pay attention to this. You may be harming yourself if you believe the praise that people give you. Because people tell you you're great at what you do, never just that you must have worked hard. So, life is learning? What do you think? Something else? Should we look at the Buddhist idea that life is suffering? Eh, that's no fun. What about life is love? Eh, too ambiguous. What about life is nothing but replicating DNA? Eh, too accurate. <laughs> so let's change the subject. A few years ago, I started learning Chinese. I'm fascinated with the writing. I'm trying to memorize how to write these characters. Now, Chinese characters look complicated, but they're mostly made up of smaller, simpler characters kind of the way that English words are made up of Latin roots and such. So you can remember the meaning of each character by knowing the meaning of its ingredients. For example, the character for language is made up of the characters for words, five, and mouth. So I imagine that language is words that at least five mouths speak. It's brilliant. I love it. The character for thank you is made up of the characters for words, body, and inch. Hmm, so this one's not so obvious. So I'm kind of imagining that maybe in Chinese culture it's considered that uh, when you say thanks, you're speaking words that give a body an inch of respectful space, maybe? I don't know. I'm going to have to look that one up. I like this one, kind of romantic. The character for name is made up of the characters for evening and mouth. So I imagine that your real name is what's spoken by a mouth in the evening. It's kind of romantic, right? I get so curious about the historical and the cultural meaning behind each one of these. But let's change the subject. Talking Heads were this great band from the late 70s to mid 80s. Their lyrics were really evocative and mysterious. They made you wonder what they were really about. But then I read an interview with the Talking Heads where they said that most of their lyrics were just random. That they would write evocative phrases onto little pieces of paper, then throw them into a bowl and shuffle them up. And then they would pull them out and put them into the song in that order. And they did this because they liked how the listener creates meaning that was never intended. So we just assume that if someone writes a song and then gets up on stage to sing it into a microphone that it must have meaning to them, right? But nope, it was just random. 
Any meaning you think it contains was put there by you, the listener, not the writer. Kind of like a Rorschach test. Back to Chinese. I got so curious about the historical meaning of these Chinese characters that I got a Chinese etymological dictionary that tells the full history behind every one. I looked up the examples I gave here, and I found out that those characters were just phonetic. That those little composite character bits were not chosen for their meaning at all, just for their sound. So it seems that I've been putting all this meaning into them myself. They actually had no meaning at all. Totally blew my mind. I'd been spending months memorizing hundreds of characters, reading all kinds of meaning and stories into the ingredients of each one of them. But after recovering from that, I thought, how many other things in life really have no meaning? Like, what else have I been putting my own meaning into thinking it was true? I know that we're wired to do this thing, right? I know that we survived on the savannah for eons because we evolved to look for patterns. Our surviving ancestors were the ones who noticed the patterns of the tiger stripes or the lion's face in the grass. A moth is so deeply wired to fly towards the light that it may never accept that your light bulb is not the moon. And we are so deeply wired to find patterns that we may never accept that many things are just random. I think we should have the same sympathy for our faulty wiring as we do for the moth. It's like evolution taught us to do this thing, but didn't teach us to stop. Throw together any random dots in a line and we'll find a face in it. Or burn some toast and we'll find Elvis in there somewhere. A carrot from my garden looks like Jesus. What does it mean? A black cat crossed my path as I walked under a ladder on Friday the 13th. What does it mean? An old friend called me just one minute after I was thinking about him. What does it mean? What does it mean that you went to a prestigious, well-known school? What does it mean that you didn't? What does it mean that your good friend died? What does it mean that you're tall? What does it mean that you have a lot of followers online? What does it mean that you don't? What does it mean that you're female? What does it mean that you're male? What does it mean that you're an entrepreneur? What does it mean that you're not? What does it mean that all of your previous attempts at something have failed? Nothing. Nothing at all. That nothing has inherent meaning. Everything is only what it is, and that's it. So let's get back to our original question and wrap this up. What is the meaning of life? Life is what? Time, choice, memory, learning, suffering, love, replicating DNA? You can tell by the variety of answers that they're just projected meanings. That you can choose to project one of these meanings onto your life if it makes you feel good or if it improves your current actions. But you know the real answer is clear and obvious now. That life is just life. It doesn't mean anything. Erase any meaning you put into past events and erase any meaning that's holding you back or erase all those times where someone told you that this means that because none of it is real. Life has no inherent meaning because nothing has inherent meaning. Life is a blank slate. You're free to project any meaning that serves you. You're free to do with it anything you want. Thank you.